Hi, friends. Welcome back to With Great People, the podcast for high performance teams. I'm Richard Kasparowski. Our special guest today is Rich Sheridan. Rich is the CEO, co founder, and chief storyteller of Menlo Innovations. It's a software design and development firm in Ann Arbor, Michigan, founded in 2001. He's also the author of two books on creating an intentionally joyful culture. There's Joy Inc., How We Built a Workplace People Love, and Chief Joy Officer, How Great Leaders Elevate Human Energy and Eliminate Fear. To support this podcast, visit my website, kasparowski.com. Hi, Rich. Thanks for joining us today. It's so good to see you. Yeah, great to see you again, Richard. I really miss you. It's been a while. <laughs> It has. I remember our delightful breakfasts is at uh, at the wonderful Kendall Hotel in yeah. downtown Cambridge. I love that hotel. It's the one that uh, the one that used to be a. It's like an ancient firehouse, fire station, exactly. and it was yeah. rehabbed into a hotel. It's actually, one of my favorite hotels on the planet. I love. Yeah. <laughs> not so not so many hotels in our lives lately. <laughs> no. No, a lot of theoretical hotels. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> I travel all over the world like I always used to. I just never leave my house now. Right. Um, so on top of that fine introduction, is there anything else you want to add? Anything else you want to, want to say about yourself to our listeners and viewers? Well, you know, it's been obviously an interesting year. Uh, I've learned a lot in this last year about what the importance is of creating an intentionally joyful culture. If you think of that as a foundation to a building, you want a strong foundation when the storm hits and boy did the storm hit and the house stood. Uh, I learned a lot about our team, about uh, you know adaptability in this time. Uh, you know enough about Menlo to know that uh, working from home and working apart from one another is a profound change for the way we've organized the company. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about this. Now, actually, the first time I encountered you, I didn't even know it was you. I, I long, long time ago, I read something that was, I don't know if you would call it a, an, it, was, it was like in the style of an academic paper in Menlo, I, you, you published something that was about extreme interviewing. Yes. Right. And it was this idea, well, you explain it. And, and, and how are you adapting that? Yeah, well, uh, uh, Good news, we'll know exactly how we're adapting that within a couple of weeks or because we're about to do one virtually, which will be right. the first time we've ever done that. Um, to understand our interview process, let me just tell a little bit about Menlo so your listeners have a context for why we would interview the way we do. Uh, for 19 years, this is our 20th year, uh, we operated in one big open room working cheek to jowl, as they say, uh, in pairs. <clears throat> at individual computers. So people are sharing a computer, doing pair programming as Kent Beck would have espoused in uh, Extreme Programming Explained, the book he wrote back in 1999. We embrace that from our first days. And so everybody at Menlo works in pairs, not just our programmers, everybody at Menlo works in pairs, working on the same task at the same time. And the pairs rotate at least every five days, sometimes more frequently. So you've got this kind of noisy environment because people are talking to each other all day. A lot of human energy in the room. You can actually feel it. It's palpable because there's so much activity, people working on their tasks. They've decided for all the years we've been in business to push the tables side to side and front to front. They actually want to be close to one another. So you can imagine that interviewing people who've never worked in an environment like this might not work if you do the traditional uh, type of interview, the kind I used to do, you know, two people sitting across the table lying to each other for a couple of hours type of interview, right? I, I talk about it like, uh, you know, if you'd imagine, uh, what is it, the Detroit Pistons or the Boston Celtics, they're looking for a new power forward or something. And they're like, hi, welcome to the office. Uh, tell me, tell me about being a power forward. Like, you know, he comes in dressed in a suit and they sit across right. a table from each other and, and they ask him questions about being a power forward. That's right. What do you love about being a power <laughs> forward? Yeah. What's the biggest challenge you've encountered and how did you overcome it? <laughs> right. Exactly. So we jettison that in our earliest days. We, we never have done a traditional interview at Menlo. Um, we exchanged it for this thing. We call it an extreme interview, which probably sounds scary to people here at the first time. 
but the word extreme just simply is uh, is uh, uh, honoring the, our roots from extreme programming. This idea of working in pairs, for example, there are many other aspects to extreme programming, but working in pairs is one of the sort of central features of a team that embraces extreme programming. And what we do is we simulate the working environment for the candidates. They come in 30, 40, 50 people at a time because that's the way Menlo is, one big open room. Uh, they come in all at the same time. We pair them together with another candidate. And then we give them the weirdest instructions ever. <laughs> Your job is to help the person sitting next to you, who, by the way, is probably competing for the same spot you are. Your job is to help them succeed, help them get a second interview, make your pair partner look good. If they're struggling, help them out. Mm -hmm. If they're stumbling for a word, help them. And so right there in the moment of the first contact, we are teaching our culture. Right? Most interviews don't teach culture. You maybe get a one day class some in the future if you get hired and that's it. But we're actually intentionally teaching our culture during the interview. 20 minutes in, we switch the pairs because that's the way we work. We switch pairs. So we want to see how you work with other human beings, how you adapt to them, how you communicate, how you respond, how you work through perhaps uh, an idea where maybe at the beginning you disagreed or you had different approaches and how do you, how do you work through that? Now, while you're working together in this pair, a Menlonian is watching, taking notes about what they see answering any questions about the task, but they're really a silent observer. Pair switch, different pair partner, different observer. We do that three times, send y'all home. That was the first interview. It's uh -huh. an audition. We're looking for good kindergarten skills. Do you play well with others? Do you not hit, bite, scratch, you know, swear, run through the room with scissors over your head, that sort of thing. Um, and then the Menlonians who watched, so if there was 30 interviewees, the Menlonians who watched, would gather because there'd be 15 of them. And then they talk about each individual person, what they saw. And it's a deep exploration of our most dearly held beliefs and values about what it takes to build a great team. And of course, there's a lot of self-effacing in that review because as we're talking about perhaps the laughable bad behaviors that we see, team members are like, oh my God, I do that too. <laughs> you know, I need to get better at this. And so the interview process for Menlo is a very exciting day. Yeah. Uh, we do typically, we've done a couple of these a year as we need to add people. Uh, we haven't done one since pandemic times because the business, as most businesses did, took a big hit in 2020. But now we're growing again. Now we need to add people. And of course, we're adding them in a virtual Menlo environment. We still do all the same, you know, pairing and that sort of thing, but doing it virtually. So we're going to run the experiment in a couple of weeks to run a virtual extreme interview with Zoom breakout rooms and there'll be pairs and observers and then we'll gather them all back together and process what happened and then put them back in their breakout rooms for the second pair. So stay tuned. Uh, it's gonna be a fun experiment. I'm sure it will result in some blog posts and articles and, and so on because uh, uh, I'm gonna be fascinated with how this all works. I can't wait. Uh, and I love, I love hearing you tell the stories. I, I love the, the whimsy in your job title, chief storyteller. It's, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, and you are a wonderful storyteller. It's part of, part of why I like to hang out with you <laughs> just to, just to listen. We always have great conversations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so this is a podcast about teams and about great teams. And so what I like to ask guests is what was the best team of your life? And, and then I sometimes I'll elaborate a little bit what I mean by team. <clears throat> Any group of two or more people aligned with a common goal. That's what I mean by team. And any group of two or more people, right? So this doesn't, this isn't constrained to work. Uh, this could be like we mentioned NBA basketball teams. This could be a sports team, a, a project team. Oh, you've written a couple books, probably had a team of people helping you with that. A uh, musical group you know, fishing friends, friends that you go fishing with, anything, any group. Of, what, what's your best team of your life? Well, you know, I, 
it's funny when you first said it, of course, I was thinking about the Menlo team and, uh, and we have a great team right now. We're just as good as we've ever been. And the, the response to the pandemic has just been phenomenal. Um, and I also remember a, a time probably that set me up for even pursuing something like Menlo back when I was just a kid. Um, I was very fortunate to have touched computers in high school back in 1971. And by 1973, I got my first job as a programmer. I, was, I couldn't even drive a car yet. Uh, and then things just started to take off. They started hiring these high school kids to write educational software for the Macomb County schools where I grew up. And I can remember this just phenomenal experience. Uh, I'm not even sure I remember what project we were working on at the time, but we were all in a room together these young kids, just you know, as curious as can be, um, kind of wowing the adults around us. Because you know, when when you were in 1973 or 74, 75, and you knew how to work computers, all the adults had no idea what you were doing. I mean, it might as well have been magic as far as they were concerned. But there we were having this heady experience. We weren't even in high school yet. And I just remember we had a stereo system. We were playing, you know, probably like Super Tramp or something like that. And um, and we were all just programming together and just having the time of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking in that moment, I want this. <laughs> I want my life to be, if this does work, this is fun. I just want to be like this. And of course, you know, career follows and it was nothing like that, right? It was, you know, it was trough of disillusionment days, most of my career. And that was probably what set me up for yearning to create what we've created at Menlo. Yep. We have that now. I've had that again for the last 20 years and it's just delightful. Um, but if I think of the best team in my life, uh -huh. I, I can't help but think of the team of Mr. and Mrs. Sheridan, oh. and the family that we've raised and the home that we've put together and the good times we've had together. Uh, I am just so blessed to have Carol in my life. Mm -hmm. And we are just such a great team being parents together, being husband and wife together. Uh, she works at Menlo. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, most people are like, you guys can work together? I said, no, no, it's even better than that. We can wallpaper together. Whoa. We can <laughs> paint together. We, you know, so uh, I, you know, I realized that is rare to be able to work with your spouse. And she, I mean, right now she's actually the only person in the office at the moment and I'm here. Uh, so we're not together, but usually on a given day, we're just a few feet from one another. Yep. And, uh, you know, and for me, that, that pairing in my life is is beyond compare as a team. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, um, so this team, you and your wife, if you could, I mean, this this is a this is current. This is this is now. What does it feel like within your body? What's what what's a word you could use to succinctly describe the sensation of this team, you and your wife? You know, the first word that comes to mind is singularity. Singularity. Uh, it, I think it, it drove our daughters crazy. Right? <laughs> They'd run to mom and say, mom, we, you know, we want this to happen or we want to do that. And then, you know, if she said no, then they'd run to me and, and like, you, did you and mom talk? I mean, you're using the exact same words and that consistency uh, between us was effortless. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think that's the other part of it. Um, I, I, we work hard together as all couples do raising a family, you know, keeping a roof over our heads, uh, obviously working hard together to, to run a company and it's been a tough year uh, for that for sure. Uh, but there's a part of it that just seems and feels effortless yeah. in the relationship. We don't have to pretend to be something we're not. Um, we just get to be who we are and we joke with one another we we get annoyed with one another every now and then like all couples will uh, but it's it's a playful annoyance it's uh, accepting of the other person and um, and 
you know, uh, realizing that there's strength in that, in that, uh, in the differences, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I love that. And I, when I, when I explain what I think a team is, I, I often use my wife, Molly and me as an example and, 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 and say something like what you said, but I love the way you said it, singularity and effortless. And I love that word effortless. Now, um, we've got, we've got a couple of words there. This is often about work teams. So I ask about measures or metrics that this was the best team of your life. Actually, I'm really curious. A marriage. Is there any way to know? How, how do you know that it's the best team of your life? Is there anything like subjective, qualitative, quantitative, anything objective you could measure or observe <laughs> so that somebody else would know it was the best team? You know, I, I mean, obviously the word that comes to mind first, at least on the subjective side, is love. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, how do you define that? Uh, you know, it's different. Uh, for a couple versus love for your fellow human beings, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, we got married very young. We were, I think uh, I was 21, she was 22. And it was just one of those things where, you know, I look at our kids now and, you know, we have three daughters in our thirties. Uh, one is married, uh, two are, or, sorry, two are married now. <laughs> Boy, am I going to get in trouble? Uh, my, my, my youngest daughter got married, uh, last, uh, Valentine's day, uh, maybe one of the last in-person weddings of you know, pre-pandemic times. Um, and, uh, but they, they got married later in life. They, my kids are astounded that we got married so young. Right. Yeah. And to us, we just, it just felt we were ready. And I think that uh, that that feeling of just blissfulness, I guess, is probably the way I would describe it in terms of subjectiveness, um, that uh, you just know what's right. You know you were meant for one another. And I, I think that's, you know, every high-performing team that I've been a part of, um, that it just it just feels right. You, it, there's a human energy to it. That's palpable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's not, you know, I mean, it, 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 Carol and I have this saying, you know, everybody has their stuff right in their lives, you know, and typically we don't get to know that about other people. Uh, you think that whatever burden you're carrying is one that is unique to you and everybody else has this blissful life like it looks on Instagram or HGTV or something like that. Uh, but everybody has their stuff and how you carry that, how you support each other through those tough times um, is just, um, uh, you know, you just knowing there's somebody there with you, for you, uh, that you can be there for them uh, when they need you. Mm -hmm. She she has this uh, uh, thing she'll say to me when times are tough, um, and uh, she looks at me. She says, "I just need to hear you say it. Tell me it's going to be okay." <laughs> and uh, you know, and and I know it is. It's going to be okay. And and you know, I know that part of her needs that part of me. Yeah. So, and I I feel this within me as as we're talking, and I. Honestly, I can't wait to go upstairs and see my wife Molly and, and tell her how much I love her because we're, we're we're like this too and it's it is palpable and it is wonderful and I, I don't know how to define love either. You know, it's funny. Just this morning, as she's leaving and she's going into the office, um, I'm giving a talk later today, and I've got some kind of you know raspy voice this morning, and she's like, as she's walking out the door, I open the door and she's going to her car and I said, "Honey, I love you." And she's like, hey, you need to take an Allegra. You got something going on there. You're giving a talk today. You know, I said, honey, I love you. She's like, look, you need to get, I said, honey, I love you. She goes, oh, I love you too. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not letting you get in that car to, before you go. And we don't exchange at least one I love you back and forth. Yeah. And, but she, you know, there she is, you know, helping support me uh, in her critical way to make sure that I uh, present my best self to you and to the talk I'm giving later today. Right, right. So we got it. So here is my next question: concrete behaviors that go into making this the best team ever. We've got uh, <laughs> supporting each other like that as an example. We've got say everything is going to be all right. 
What else is going? What are some other concrete behaviors that you have? You know, again, I, 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 it's funny. My mind's going back and forth between my marriage, which you know is what we're sort of focusing on, and then the Menlo team, yeah, uh, because we have a great team at Menlo, and I think it boils down to some pretty simple, basic life behaviors, uh, and we call them at Menlo good kindergarten skills. Do you play well with others? Uh, do you share? Um, I think beyond that, the deeper parts are uh, the ability to see the world through the other person's eyes. Right? I, I remember one time, I, <laughs> this is really ironic, um, uh, one of my favorite books of all time is Leadership and Self-Deception by the Arbinger Institute. And they actually teach a class in what they call the outward mindset which is stop focusing here, look out into the world, you know, understand the world through the eyes of others and see other people as human beings, not as objects, not as employees, not as colleagues, not as customers, but see them as people. And I went away and took this class and it was three days out in Salt Lake City and I came home and it was Saturday morning, I'd just gotten home. And, uh, and the thing I'm like most focused on in my life is I wanna keep up on my email. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that's how a lot of people reach out to me. So I usually have less than 10 messages in my inbox. I think when we got on the call this morning, I had two. Right? So I'm, I'm an, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a commitment, right? I mean, I, I just, there's a lot of other LinkedIn messages, tweet, Twitter messages. Uh, if you leave me a voicemail, you may not hear from me in months. Uh, but if you want to contact me, send me an email and I, you mm -hmm. will hear from me. Um, so there I am Saturday morning and I get up early, I get my coffee and I'm on the deck and I'm, I'm working through emails. And remember, I had just taken this class on outward mindset, right? right. Carol gets up a little later me, she pops out. She's like, hey, Rich, uh, got a few things I want to get done today. You know, she usually has like her weekend list, right? And I said, absolutely, honey, happy to help. I just got a few emails I want to get through. Two hours later. I laugh because this is me too. <laughs> It's not emails, but it's this kind of uh -huh. focus right. that actually gets in the way of connecting with the people I love the most. <laughs> Two hours later, she pops yeah. her head out. <laughs> she says, Rich, you're killing me. I'm like, oh my gosh, honey. I'm so she's like, I can't believe you've been now. Here's here's the moment, right? Two different mindsets. I'm thinking she's got to understand I've been gone for three days. I'm way behind on emails. I got to get through this. But then miraculously, and I will say uncharacteristically for me, <laughs> I remember the class. And I look at her and I say, you're right, honey. And I very gently start closing my laptop in that instant, not slam it down, <laughs> just very gently close the laptop. And she says, I can't believe you're doing this. You've been gone for three days. Do you know how behind we are and things around the house? And I just looked at her and I said, you're absolutely right, honey. And she just, she wanted to keep going. And I said, what can I do for you? What's the first thing on your list? She says, well, I got all these things I want you to do. I said, great, name the top three. She says, well, I want you to do this and this and this. I said, awesome. And it just completely stopped the conflict, right? Right, Because I thought, I because I was able to think of her and say, gosh, she's right. I've been gone for three days. She's behind on things she wants to get done. I can get the email anyhow. Yeah. Now, it was really funny. Later that day, we were going to a Detroit Tigers baseball game. And uh, we're driving down I-94, going to Detroit from Ann Arbor. And she said, Hey, that thing that happened this morning, <laughs> that was really neat. Did you learn that in that class? Were you, were you just toying with me? I said, no, no, I did learn that in the class, but it was real. I, and she said, that was really neat. <laughs> so, so it is possible to teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think this is the key, is that ability to empathize with other people to yeah. see the world through their eyes, to think of them as another human being, to try and figure out what's the story in their head right now about mm -hmm. me, right? Because we always think we're right, don't we? 
I mean, at least us guys do. <laughs> and wait, wait, you think think we're right? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that is an excellent example of uh, a concrete behavior. Uh, like, these are things that I forget to do. I'll, I'll close the laptop, but I forget to look at her lovingly <laughs> and do it slowly. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. What what other advice could you add on to this so that? anybody listening or watching could have the best team of their lives, any kind of team whatsoever. I have this phrase I use at Menlo about the culture we've created in my role in it. And as CEO, as co-founder, uh, as a leader of this team, I tell the world that my job is to pump fear out of the room. And I will tell you, that is the opposite of the way I was raised as a leader, as a manager, as a director, as a vice president, I was taught by the people who were above me at the time, oh no, you motivate people with fear. That's your job. You know, you, you raise an eyebrow at a meeting, you cross your arms, you get, you know, you, uh, I had one time, you'll love this. I had a boss once who told me, Rich, you know, as, as I was just getting into management, right? He says, let me give you a few tips. He says, if you're ever walking down a corridor and you see two of your people talking to one another, just walk up to them and stand there. They'll get back to work. <laughs> right. Now, and he would have this annoying thing. Now, I really admire Tom Peters, who wrote the book In Search of Excellence so many years ago. And Tom has this thing he calls management by walking around. Just go out, be with your people, you know, get to know them, uh, that sort of thing. Very noble thing that Tom had. But this boss adopted that. But I called what he did management by walking around and annoying people. He'd, he'd bump into your cube and he'd go, how's it going? <laughs> what you working on? You almost done? You coming in this weekend? Well, you know, there was only one answer to that question. Yeah. And fear goes up. Yeah. Adrenaline and cortisol start filling your veins, shut down the most interesting part of your brain. And the trouble with fear is fear doesn't make bad news go away. It makes it go into hiding. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of what all of your listeners can take away from this, wherever they are in a leadership change, whether they're at the front end or the top end or however you want to characterize it, you are in control of how much fear you're bringing into a conversation. You can decide to, to double down on fear. You can decide to bring a even slightly optimistic voice to things. Yeah, it's tough right now. It is going to be okay because we're going to work hard together to do it. That is an attitude that we all have control over. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to add on? Anything to share? Anything uh, interesting happening at Menlo and your, in your life? Any writing projects? I don't know. Yeah, you know, it, it, we have, this has been a year of adaptations for sure, for all of us, right? Everybody in the world for that matter. Um, and one of the things that has been a, um, a tradition of Menlo for all of its 20 years is we open our doors to the world. People come and visit. Uh, they come on tours. We usually host between three and 4,000 people a year come from all over the world just to see us. And last year, <laughs> January, I'll say last year, we <laughs> thought we would host 5,000 people at Menlo. Wow. That was one of our sort of big, big goals. We've never had that many. And of course, in February, that all shut down. And then it looked like, you know, we had already hosted quite a few by then. We were actually on track to host 5,000 people based just on simple number of people per month metrics. And, um, and then, of course, it all disappeared. And that was... It was sad. It was unnerving. Uh, it was, it felt like we'd lost something really important and special to us. And then in June, one of our good friends called up and said, Hey, how are you guys doing? How, how did you adapt? How's this thing to Menlo? How's this pairing working? How's this, you know, everybody working together in a big open room? What, what are you doing now that you're all home? I said, well, would you like to see? He says, what do you mean? I said, well, how about if we try doing a virtual tour of the virtual Menlo? Yeah. He says, you can do that? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> we'll give it a try. We'll run the experiment, which is a famous phrase. In well, since June, we've hosted people from 45 countries and 37 states. Wow. Uh, it, they're coming, you know, by the hundreds. 
uh, last week I told the team, I said, you got to slow it down a little bit for me. Uh, I did three tours in one day and that was you know about six hours of touring yeah. uh, but uh, they're coming from all over the world it's neat because it's democratized now there's no uh, airplane fee no hotel no time right. commitment they just come for 90 minutes and they go and the majority of them we do are free and so mm -hmm. if your listeners want to come see menlo in its virtual form just go to our website click on uh, tours and sign up for one we do uh, two or three or four public tours a week uh, for free. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I haven't been on the tour. I've, I've, I've always wanted to. I think I will. Yeah, it's easy now. It's uh, literally, you know, it, uh, you know, the other day I was giving a talk in London and, uh, and in, I in London, <laughs> in London. Yeah. And I, I told the crowd, I said, Hey, I got to run. I, I've got to talk. I've got to give in Brazil. And they <laughs> said, Oh, have a safe flight. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to be right here in this room. I got to be there in 15 minutes. Right. And it's it's kind of one of the neat things that I think uh, we've all experienced is while we're isolated and separated from one another, yeah. we're also drawing together in a way that we haven't seen. You know, uh, I don't know about you. I, I actually think the voice call is going to be one of those quaint reminders of, you know, of the past. I think we're yeah. going to have a lot more of this. It's really weird now to just talk to somebody on your phone. It's like, you know, let's, let's see each other. I've yeah, right? seen you for cool. a couple of years and now here we are together, just like we were at breakfast at the Kindle. And it's really delightful. Yeah. And so I think, it, I think the other opportunity that we, sh we can't miss in this time, and I've noticed it at Menlo, and I'm sure others, if they think about it hard, are seeing the same thing. We are seeing more of the human in our people, mm -hmm. right? When we connect with one another at Menlo, I see that Sarah has three cats. And I didn't know that about Sarah, you know, and she has unique names for her cats that uh, give a sense of the kind of science fiction books she likes to read and that sort of thing. And, you know, we see the, the, the paintings on Josh's wall in his basement that were done by his grandfather. We see George with little Elsie draped around his neck. She's 20 months old and she just wants to be where dad is. And so we get to see not only his growing daughter, but how he is as a dad when he's yeah. working. And so I think this peek into the humanity of our teams is just such a grand opportunity that we can't let slip by. Mm -hmm. Because too often in our work lives, we, we have this bifurcation, right? There's the rich Sheridan at home and the dad and the husband and the neighbor and the community member. And then there's CEO Menlo Prez. No, it's the same guy, right? So we have an opportunity to really get to know our people, understand what's going on in their lives if, as much as they're willing to share, of course. And that's, that is a great opportunity that we just can't let slip by while we're so worried about all the real stuff that's going on in the world right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thank you so much for sharing that. So we've got, you see on the wall behind you, at Menlo Prez. Uh, we've got the Menlo Innovations website. Uh, is there any other ways that people could contact you if they were interested in, in chatting, striking up a conversation, anything? Yeah, well, come take a tour. Just go to our website, click on tours and visit. Uh, if you want to write me an email, rsheridan at menloinnovations.com. Guarantee it all. I'll respond. I heard you're good at email. <laughs> I'm good at email. Uh, link in with me. I'm pr getting pretty good at staying up on LinkedIn stuff too. Uh, mention this podcast just because I get a lot of weird LinkedIn requests that I'm I'm a little bit you know uh, uh, I guess uh, discerning about who I accept. So if you say hey I saw you on Richard Kasparowski's uh, podcast, I really love to connect, and I'll just say yes. Cool. All right. Well, Rich Sheridan, thank you so much for, for being on the show today. Uh, I am so grateful that we had this time together. Thank you. You bet. My, my, uh, my pleasure. And remember, listeners, to support this podcast, visit my website, kasparowski.com. <laughs>